tell you what, we need to learn to enjoy Jesus. I tell people if they don't enjoy Jesus, heaven's going to be hell for them. You understand? We better get to know Jesus in a different level. And then Psalm 16, 11 said, In His presence is fullness of joy. At His right hand are pleasures forevermore. God wants us. I believe that Jesus was the happiest man ever lived. I prove it to you. It says, God anointed Jesus with the oil of gladness far above His brothers. And there's something far above all His brothers. See, I'm telling you guys, God wants you to be happy. But He wants you to be holy. You can't be happy without being holy. A double-minded person ends up unstable in all their ways. Is that correct? So we need to be steadfast in our pursuit of Jesus. One time I took the platform. Oh, it's wonderful to be here, Pastor. I really mean that. I didn't think I was going to get to come. I was in uh, Lubbock uh, this week speaking. And uh, uh, it was nine degrees when I left there. And I'm telling you, they shut down every airplane that could uh, fly, it seemed like. And uh, pretty one of my one of my flights got uh, detained and canceled 15 times yesterday. And so, boy, they said, there's no way in the world you're going to get down to Houston. And but God always makes a way, doesn't He does for it. It seems like there's no way God makes a way. And so He worked it out. It's wonderful. So we're here. And here's the thing that thrills me. Did you know that God knew that you were going to be sitting right there before He created the whole world? That's exactly right. Here's what it says. It says, He chose you before you were you. It says, before we've ever lived a single day of our life, God has all of our days recorded in His book. Psalms 139. Verse 16 and 17 says, All of our days, every single one of them, are written in His book before we've ever lived a single one of them. What you and I need, I suppose, is we need a synchronization between what He wrote and what we want. Amen. Jesus did it, didn't He? He said, I only do what I see my Father doing. I only say what I hear my Father saying. So we're delighted to be here. God knew that You'd be here. God has some things in store for us, some good things. Everything He does, He does to help us, not hurt us. Right. Aren't you glad? Do you have favorite verses in the Bible? One of my favorite verses in the whole Bible is Nahum, N-A-H-U-M, chapter 1, verse 7. Nahum, chapter 1, verse 7 says, The Lord is good. Didn't say He was or is going to be. In your situation, He's good. The Lord is good. A very present help in the time of trouble. And He knows those that are trusting, relying, and clinging to Him. Aren't you glad God's help is available to us? Yes. I love that it says in Psalm 121, verse 1, I lift up my eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help comes from where? The Lord who made the heavens and the earth. And I love that. It says, He that keeps thee will not slumber nor sleep. Aren't you glad God doesn't take a vacation? Yeah. His mercies are new what? Yeah. Every morning great is His faithfulness. Now, I want to talk about some stuff tonight. I want to talk about what a difference one day can make. I know a lot of people, they miss the victories of the future because they're trapped in the pains of the past. Yeah. We need to understand His mercies are new every morning. It's a new day every day with God. And I'm telling you, here's what the psalmist said, I've been young, now I'm old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken or His seed begging for it. God will get you through the valleys, through the shadows, through the dark places, through the water, through the fire. Say, I'm coming through. Here's what I like. Don't you love how God does? Psalms 23 says, He prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies. And let me tell you what. Right in the middle of the battle, God hollers time out and throws your party. <laughs> yeah, right in the middle of the battle. The devil's throwing all this stuff on you, trying to get you away from God. And God gives you a bang. It's a victory, a victory banquet. He says, He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. He anoints my head with oil. Isn't that cool? I like that. Listen, God has good things for you. Now, I'm a realist. I believe the Bible really means what it says. I really mean it. So I was reading Jeremiah 29 11. Jeremiah 29 11 says, I know my thoughts, I think, toward you, declares the Lord. Thoughts of your success, not your failure. My intent is to bring you to a good end, not a dismal demise. So I said, hold it, God. Hold it just a minute. You said you think about me. What do you think about me? And answer me. Now, this ought to be important because whatever he thinks about Bobby Connor is precisely what he thinks about you. Amen. He's no respecter of persons. Amen. What he thinks about me is exactly what he thinks about you. So I said, you said you think about me. Jeremiah 29, 11. I know my thoughts. I think towards you, declares the Lord. I said, okay. You said you think about me. What do you think about me? And he answered me. Here's what he said. You ready? He said, I think you're more beautiful than a flower. 
Now, I didn't understand it, but it felt good. I said, God, I don't understand that, but it really feels good. And so here's what he said. Consider the lily. Solomon, in all his regalia, was not adorned as one of these. Let me ask you this. Could Solomon pimp out? Woo, Solomon could get his stuff together. Did you read 1 Kings 10? 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 1 says that the Queen of Sheba comes all the way to Solomon to see how he dressed. How he dressed his servants, how he prepared the house of God, how he prepared his own house. And it says, she was so stunned, she left breathless. Now, I believe that's going to happen. I believe political leaders are going to make their way to the house of God, and they're going to find out about the fame of Jesus. See, Solomon then represents the glory of God on the people of God. Isn't that something? So the, the queen of Sheba comes, because Solomon could get it together. And he said... Consider the lily. Solomon in all his regalia was not adorned as one of these. So I said, well, I like that. I said, what else do you think about? Me? And he said this. I think you're more valuable than a bird. Again, I said, God, it feels real good inside of me, but I don't know what you're talking about. More valuable than a bird. He said, consider the sparrow. Doesn't have to toil and spin. Your Father in Heaven tends to the bird. Are you not more valuable than a bird? See? Notice how both of those started. Consider. So I looked up the Greek word consider. It's the strongest word in the human language for focus. Focus. Remember it says, consider Him. So we need to focus on Him, doesn't we? Because He's focused on us. Do you believe He's focused on us? Amen. Oh, every day of your life, He watches you. The eyes of the Lord... It says we're naked and open and exposed. Isn't that something that he, he has us under constant surveillance? Yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad the devil can't slip up and give a sucker punch. God's got us covered. Amen. Psalms 91 11. The angels of God encamp around about those that trust God. We need to understand God wants to see us succeed. He created you for victory. Do you know that, don't you? Honestly, we're fighting from victory, not for victory. 2,000 years ago, our, our Savior stretched Himself upon a tree and cried out, It's finished! Aren't you glad He didn't say, I'm finished? Yeah. He said, It's finished. And He used a term that's a farming term. Now people go, Why do you talk so fast? I used to buy television time, I'm cheap. <laughs> so I tried to give you as much as I can. And since Bob's paying for this, I'll slow down. <laughs> yeah. That's right. What we've got to do now, we've got to realize... God's got purpose for us. There's 7.2 or 3 billion people alive on the planet today and not a single one like you. Here's the thing that gets me. God chose you in eternity past to live in the present to forge the future. Esther 4.14 says, you're in the kingdom for such a time as this. Prophets are supposed to know the timing of the Lord. We're supposed to have that anointing that rested upon the sons of Issachar. They said they had understanding of the times to know what the people of God should be committing themselves to. And he says, and all their brethren were at their command. You believe if you've got the wisdom of God, people will want to follow you? Yes. Say yes. yes. You believe God will give you the wisdom of God if you'll ask Him? Yes. James 1.5 says, if any of us are deficient in wisdom, let him ask God for giving God, and He'll give it to us lavishly. <coughs> God wants us to have wisdom. Here's a great verse about the wisdom of God. Can I walk around? I very seldom ever stand up here, you know. Uh, but I will if I have to. But uh, I like to meander around. I like to get close enough to spit on me if I have to. You know? Sometimes I get so excited I forget to swallow. I a big old... <laughs> oh, great. That would be good. I'll have somewhere to put my water. All right. What's your name? Joshua. Hey, that's in the Bible. <laughs> I love Joshua in the Bible, don't you? I love Joshua 1-9. Be bold! Yeah. Be bold! Yeah. Be very courageous. Go do what you're called to do because you're not going by yourself. Amen. I said, God, why are you have, did you read Joshua 1? Be bold, be bold, be bold, be bold, be very bold. I said, Lord, why do you have to keep telling us to be bold? He said, because you're not. Yeah. <laughs> you know why we're not very bold? We're not very righteous. Proverbs 28 1 says, The righteous will be as bold as a lion. I suspect our timidity is testimony to our carnality. What do you think? Look out now. Look out now. You get right with God, you get bold. That's right. See, the devil has a counterfeit for everything God has to give you. If the Holy Ghost wants to give you boldness, the devil wants to give you arrogance. A lot of difference between boldness and arrogance. 
One is the spirit, the other is the flesh. Correct? That's right. What's your name? I got in the Bible too. God bless you, Mary. I tell you what, things are about to turn around for you. I'm telling you, you're about to be one of the happiest women in town. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, he's going to give you something money can't buy. He's going to pour into your spirit. Philippians 4, 6 through 8. Tranquility of soul. Oh, I'll tell you what. That, that, I'm, let, let me tell you something. Well, I'm disagreeing. Here's what, the, here's what the Lord said. He said, you better tell my people they can't medicate. Anxiety have to repent of it. You cannot medicate anxiety you have to repent of it. That verse says, be anxious for nothing. But in prayer and supplication with the heart of gratitude, let all your requests be made on, known to God. And the peace of God, and it means tranquility of soul, will keep your heart. See, you, if you look at the world and the situations, the circumstances going on in the world, you'll lose hope. But if you look to the Lord, Isaiah 26, 3, that will keep him in what? Perfect peace. Perfect peace when our mind is stayed upon him. Jesus said men's hearts failing them for the things they see coming upon the earth. You look out, it's pretty visible. But you look up, there's hope. Did you know I love the word hope? Let me tell you, for 10 years now, the devil's been doing everything he can to steal your hope. To get you to give up on your dream. To drop out and cop out and say, well, I tried it, it didn't work. Here's your verse, you ready? Hebrews 10.35 Hebrews 10.35 says, Don't fling away your hope, your steadfast confidence in God, because your steadfast confidence in God brings with it great recompense or reward. Don't give up on God. Don't give up. You need that anointing that rested upon Caleb. I like Caleb. His name means salty old dog. Boy, he's tenacious. He? he would not give up. Oh, I saw a mantle come through a building one day and I said, Lord, what is that? He said, that's the anointing of some Caleb I'm looking for somebody to put on. Well, oh, I'll tell you, even after 40 years of delay, none on his part, he was still ready to take his mouth. See, a lot of times, the devil will get you discouraged and you'll give up. Don't give up on your dream. Don't give up. God's going to bring you to pass. He says, all of his promises are what? Yes, yes. 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 He says he'll rule over his people with the word yes. Aren't you glad? I talked to you a while ago telling you his plans towards you are good. A lot better than you can make for yourself. Amen. I don't know why we get it that if we give our life to God, we're going to be miserable. <laughs> no, the happiest people in the world are sanctified, saved. Amen. I tell you, the most miserable people on earth, you want to know? It's not the drug addicts and prostitutes and lost people. They're miserable. There's no rest of the wicked, said the Lord. They're miserable, but they're not the most miserable people. Most miserable people on earth are Christians trying to live lost. Yeah, they tasted, they know the Lord is good, and they turn back. Woo. Most miserable, a double minded person, remember that? Yeah. Well, Candy, is everything going good? I met her just, just seeing what was on the pew. Isn't that something? They tell me you're a worship leader. Isn't that good? They asked me one time, they said, Brother Connor, do you teach on your, do you sing on your CDs? I said, no, I don't think the church goes that deep into tribulation. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't sing. <laughs> well, I, mean, uh, I sing, but I sing like Louis Armstrong. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. They say, don't quit your day job. <laughs> well, it's a great, great, great time to be in the kingdom of God. Remember I told you Esther 414, you're in the kingdom for such a time as this. Yeah. Never been a time quite like this. I don't think I've ever seen... Did you know I've been preaching 44 years, five times a week for 44 years? Do the man. I've averaged speaking five times a week for 44 years. I've averaged speaking five times a week for 44 years. That's a lot of yakking. <laughs> Guess what I figured out? Guess what I figured out after all of that preaching? I figured out if you can figure it out, it ain't God. If you can just wrap your mind around and go, yes, bless God, hallelujah. No! The natural mind receives not the things of the Spirit. You can't figure God out. But you can experience Him. Yes. That's true. You, you believe that? Yes. Yes, you can. Yes. What a day to be alive. Esther 414, in the kingdom for such a time as this. Yes. Every time I quote that, Esther 414, it buzzes inside of me. Amen. But there's something better than being in the kingdom, the kingdom being in you. Amen. 
The kingdom of God yes. is in you. Here's your great verse. You ready? Yeah. Say yes. yes. Philippians 2, 13. Oh, Philippians 2, 13 says, Why does God that works in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure? Boy, when I read that phrase, good pleasure, yeah. my heart trembled. Mm -hmm. The creature Bobby can do something to bring the Creator God good pleasure. So I started scouring the Bible. Looking, what could I do? What could I do that would bring God good pleasure? Whatever that is, that's our highest goal. Whatever that is, that's our most noble quest, is to bring God good pleasure. Don't you think? Yes. Say yes. yes. Guess what I found? Remember now, he, we're looking for something to bring God good pleasure. Scouring through the Bible, I landed on Luke 12, 32. Read part of the Bible, Jesus talking. Yeah. That's right. God wants you to dance. That's true. So, anyway, so the red part of the Bible. That's Jesus talking. Luke 12, 32. It says, Oh, shuddering, shivering, fearful little flock, don't be so timid. It's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. See! That's what He's looking for. God's not schizophrenic. He doesn't have one plan one day and another plan the next. His original plan is found in Genesis 1, 26. Amen. Genesis 1, 26, you get to hear God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit speaking. Here's what they say. Let us make man in our own image. And let's give them kingdom control. God has not changed His plan one iota. Somebody's going to get back everything Adam gave up. <laughs> Ask three questions all over the earth. If not now, when? If not here, where? If not you, who? Is God looking for it? Second Chronicles 16.9. Say it. Second Chronicles 16.9. He said, the eyes of the Lord are roving to and fro throughout the whole earth. What are you looking for, God? I'm looking for a people whose heart is upright towards me. He said, when I find them, I fully support all they put their hands to do. Woo! I looked it up in Hebrew. It says, I'm looking for people that have no agenda but mine. No plan, no purpose but mine. Here's what it says in Ezekiel. Say it, Ezekiel 44, 23. It says, one of the ministries of the Zadok priest is to teach the people of God the vast difference between the profane and the holy, the worthwhile and the worthless. One of our jobs is to teach the people of God the vast difference between the profane and the holy, the worthwhile and the worthless. So I looked at the word profane. You see it? I looked up the Hebrew word profane. It means empty, worthless, no eternal value. Empty, worthless, no eternal value. Solomon said a word almost exactly like it, almost like a Siamese twin. He used the word vanity, remember? All his vanity, vanity. And so I'll tell you the word vanity. Take your hand, hold it up like this. You're going to hold your hand. Do it like this. Now open your hand. What you got? That's the Hebrew word vanity. Attempting to catch the wind. Always ending up empty handed. And so that's the, that's the word just like profane. Empty, worthless, no eternal value. So I'm supposed to be teaching the people of God how to live a life that's with purpose and not an empty life, a fruitless life. So, here we go. I had the word down, profane. Empty, worthless, no eternal value. Jesus appears, and he said to me, Bobby, do you know my definition of profane? Instantly, I knew I didn't. You know, you know who's going to school when Jesus asks the question. Do you know my definition of profane? I said, apparently not. I knew what the Hebrews said. Empty worthless, no eternal value. Here's what Jesus said his definition of profane is. Are you ready? Anything man is doing that God did not initiate. Yes. Empty worthless, no eternal value. No wonder Jesus said Matthew 6 33, but seek him what? First, his kingdom. All these other things fall in the right place when we put his kingdom first. Is that correct? That's right. How do we seek first the kingdom of God? I suggest we follow the Holy Spirit. Here's a great verse about guidance. You ready? Okay. You got something on your shirt. Here's a good verse about God. You ready? Nehemiah 9.20. Say it. Nehemiah, Nehemiah 9.20 says, He said this. He said, He'll, 
gave them His good spirit to instruct them. You gave also your good spirit to instruct them and without not your manna from their mouth. Now I like that. He gave His good spirit, Holy Spirit, to instruct us and without not His manna from our mouth. Now I like that, don't you? Amen. Now who's going to instruct us? The Holy Spirit. He's called the good spirit there. You'd be surprised how many people are afraid of the Holy Ghost. I, a lot of people think Holy Ghost shows up in Acts 2, 1. Holy Ghost shows up in Genesis 1, 2. And flowing and functioning throughout the whole Bible. A lot of people think Holy Ghost is something between a parakeet and a pigeon. Oh, oh. <laughs> Listen, I'll tell you who the Holy Ghost is. He's God. <coughs> He's the only God agent that works on this planet. God the Father's Word. God the Son's Word. Now, who's down here? God the Holy Spirit. Boy, we need, there's not one single miracle recorded in the New Testament that Jesus did until He was filled with the Holy Ghost. That's right. Not a single one. He did get filled with, filled with the Holy Ghost in the Acts 10.38. God did something. He anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with Him. Oh, wow. Can't divorce those two. Holy Ghost and power. Can't have Holy Ghost without power. Can't have power without the Holy Ghost. We need a new appreciation for Holy Ghost. Yes, he wrote the Bible and he interprets the Bible. Yeah. All scripture is given by the yeah. Jehovah, the That's breath, good. the Spirit of God. How do we get to know the Holy Spirit better? I want to stay on that verse, just Nehemiah 9 20. He gave his good spirit to instruct us and withheld not his manna from our mouth. Mm -hmm. You believe this? Here's you. Revelation 2.17. Say it. Revelation 2.17. Said, Jesus said to him that overcomes, I will grant to eat. The hidden man. Whoa! I'm already intrigued. God's got some stuff hidden from us, for us. You believe God hides stuff from us, for us? Yeah. Yeah. Proverbs 25 2. Say it. Proverbs, Proverbs 25 2. Say it. It's the glory of God to conceal a matter, the honor of kings to search it out. So he hides things from us, for us. And he says if we'll be an overcomer, he'll let us eat the hidden man. Here's a good verse about secrets. God's got some secrets. It's Deuteronomy, say it. Deuteronomy 29, 29. 29, 29. Yeah. He wants you to dance before Him. Yeah. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, The secret things belong unto the Lord, but the things that are revealed belong unto us and our children from now on. I want to know His secrets, don't you? Here's what He told me. He said, I shout my truths, but I whisper my secrets. Any of us can get his truth. The Bible's full of them. But few of us... Now, I saw you taking pictures. Can you make me look like Brad Pitt? <laughs> <laughs> Shave a little off and, you know... Mm. Well, he said, no, I don't think that's going to work. He'll hide things from us for us. Do you believe it? There it is, Deuteronomy 29, 25. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things which are revealed belong unto us and our descendants forever. Amen. I want to know what God wants to give us, don't you? Amen. It says, My people perish for lack of knowledge. So we need to know what God is offering us, don't we? Amen. I tell you what's about to happen. God's about to fill His people so full of the Word of God, when we open our mouth, we're declaring back to God His promise. Yes, God. In turn, prayer from a plea to proclamation. Amen. Come on, God, good! Amen. To God you said. Yes. Yes. Here it is, 1 John 5, 14. Say it. First John. This is the confidence we have in Him. If we ask Him anything according to His will, we know that He hears us. If we know that He hears us, we're totally assured. We have the petitions we're making to Him. Yes. God loves to answer. There it is. And if we know that He hears us whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we're desiring from Him. Amen. See? God will fill us full of His promises and we speak back to Him His promise. Thank you. Yeah. There's a verse in the Bible. If it wasn't in the Bible, I'd never believe it. It says, make up your mind what you want. Yes. Tell God what that is and He'll do it for you. Yeah. Uh, it's in here. Um, I just, I just, uh, I, I'll, I'll read it out. This is an amplified version. I'll, I'll read it. I'll read it out. This one, and see, see what you think. Here we go. You shall also decide and decree a thing, 
and it, what you've decided and decreed, shall be established for you. And the light of God's favor will shine on your pathway. You shall decide a thing. Make up your mind. Amen. Then you decree what you've decided. And the Lord will establish. Same word for create. The Lord will establish it in the light of His favor. Shine on your pathway. Yeah. Hallelujah. Wow. You go, where is that? Look for me. <laughs> no, it's Job 22, 28. Job 22, 28, it's the truth. Jesus said almost the same thing, Mark 11, 20, what? 24. What's the other thing you desire when you pray? Right. Remember that? Yes. If you say that about it, not doubt in your heart, you'll have whatever you said. Remember that? Yeah. When I quote that in the North American church where we are tonight, I hear people go, What? Hold it! That's that Kenneth Copeland stuff. Here's what I tell them. I believe Jesus said it before Kenneth. <laughs> See, we better learn what God's promised. That's right. We have not because we ask not. I want you to know something about words. They're powerful. The power of death and life is somewhere. Oh, into your words. Isn't that something? Very important. Power of death and life in your words. Yeah. Well, anyway. How do we know that we can please God? We need to get our heart filled with His Word. Don't, you believe the Word of God is wonderful? Amen. Psalms 19, verse 7. The Word of the Lord is perfect. That's what it says. The statutes of the Lord, the commandments of the Lord. The, all of those are talking about the Word of God. You're, you ought to read Psalms 19, verse 7 through 14. There it is. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the citizens. See, do you believe if you obey the Word of God, it'll guarantee success? Yes. Right here it says it'll, it'll, it, it'll convert the soul, it'll make wise the simple. Watch this. Look at Joshua 1.8. Joshua 1.8, it said, The word of this book shall not depart from your eyes. You shall meditate upon it day and night. And it will guarantee you overwhelming success. Yes. There it is. Joshua 1.8. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then shall you make your way prosperous, and then shall you have overwhelming success. Amen. That's what it says. Amen. Well, you know, I don't have a lot of time to study the Bible. Well, you're too busy. Drop off some stuff. You better seek the Lord. You know what the Lord told me the other day? He told me in a pretty hostile tone. Here's what he said. Hey! You tell my people, when it comes to seeking me, I detest multitasking. Whoa! Look out now. You can't find him if you're not seeking him with all your heart. Jeremiah 29, 12 and 13 says, You'll find me when you search for me and seek for me with all your heart. Remember it says about Martha when Jesus came to Mary and Martha's house? Martha got busy, remember that? Not doing something bad, trying to do something good for Jesus. But it says Mary chose the one thing that was most needful, to sit and soak at the feet of Jesus. So he told me, he said, you tell my people when it comes to seeking me, I detest multitasking. That's your people. It tells me think, I'm so busy. Wow. Just to be honest, he deserves first place, doesn't he? Yes. Yes. Anything else is not, not worthy of him, honestly. Amen. Wow. Seek him with all your heart. Seek him all he may be found. Call upon him. I'll tell you what, here's a great verse right now. It says, this is a time of his favor. Can I read it to you? Yes, Bob. Yeah. Here it is. I'm reading, I'm reading right now out of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And I'll, I'll read verse 2. Well, I'll only read verse 1 since I'm that close. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Verse 1, laboring together as God's fellow workers with Him then, we beg of you not to receive the grace of God in vain. That merciful kindness by which God exerts His holy influence on souls, turning and turning them to Christ and keeping and strengthening them. Do not receive that grace to no avail. Verse 2, for He says, in the time of faith, of an assured welcome, I have listened to you, I have heeded your call. I have helped you on the day of deliverance, the day of salvation. Behold, 
Now is truly the time for a gracious welcome and acceptance of you from God. Behold, now is the day of salvation. This is the time He'll hear you and help you. This is the time of His faith. This is the time things that you couldn't do, you can do. He's here to help you. That's what He says. Look, look what He says. For He says. What does that mean? Verse 2. For He says. It means Paul's quoting somebody. I'll tell you who's quoting. He's quoting God. He's quoting what's written in Isaiah 49 verse 8. Isaiah 49 verse 8. Let's see if he quoted him right. Okay. Let me find Isaiah 49 verse 8. Say, look for it, Bobby. Here we go, Isaiah 49, verse 8. Look what it says. Thus saith the Lord. I like that, don't you? <laughs> Thus saith the Lord. In acceptable time, in favorable time, I have heard and answered you. And in the day of salvation, I have helped you. And I will preserve you and give you for a covenant to the people to raise up and establish the land from its present state of ruin and the appropriation and cause them to inherit the desolate moral waste of heathenism. This is their heritage. Yeah. That's Isaiah 49 8. Don't you think we need to know the Bible better? Yeah. It's the only offensive weapon I found in the Bible. Taking the sword of the Spirit with just the what? I'll tell you what's happened to us. We've exchanged an experience for the Word. I'll tell you what, an experience without the Word is dangerous. You can get led off into anything. We need a foundation of the Word of God. Amen. Right? We need to study the Word of God. Let me read honest. All of us do. That's where, that's, that's right. Study show yourself the proof. A work. Look, we got steps. I'm moving on up this world. Bless you, God. <laughs> Go back here in the high seat something. God bless you. You believe this word on favor? God wants to give you favor. I looked at the champions of the Bible. Every champion had one thing in common. Favor. Right. Favor! Say favor. favor. The favor factor is what really gets you from one place to the other. Favor. It says favor lasts a lifetime. You believe God wants to bless you in such a dimension the enemy will see it and it'll make him so mad he'll gnash his teeth and march away? Yeah. That's Psalms 120. That's Psalms 112. Psalms 112. The last verse says, God will bless you and your family in such a dimension. Your enemies and adversaries will see it and they'll grind their teeth and stomp off it. Whoa! I like that, don't you? Psalms 112, the last verse. Psalms 112, verse 2 says, The seed of the upright will be mighty in the earth. God will make your children mighty, you believe it? You get hungry and desperate for God, your kids will benefit. Isaiah 44, 3 and 4. What are they doing good keeping up with this? Whoever's punching the buttons are right I threw them out there, man. There it is. Isaiah of Psalms 112, verse 2. The seed of the upright shall be mighty upon the earth. The generation of the upright will be what? Blessed. See? People pay tons of money trying to send their kids off to get an education and neglect to teach them the Word of God. That's right. That's right. Neglect to live a godly life in front of them. It says right here they'll be very blessed. Okay, go to the last verse of, the, of the, that uh, chapter, if you will. And, and I want to see about the gnashing and grinding their teeth, stomping away. <laughs> They'll find it. <laughs> well, I guess I could find it myself. But. <laughs> the wicked shall see it. The blessings, prosperity, goodness of God. The wicked shall see it and be green. He shall gnash with his teeth and melt away. To desire the wicked. Will perish. See, there's people who don't want to see you succeed. You believe that? Yes. But God has destined you to succeed. He said, I have created you to be the head, not the tail. Yes. Romans 8 37 says, You're a, what? More than a conqueror. He wrote a word, Hooper Nike, super overcome. That's who you are. I'm tired of the body of Christ not knowing who they are. And, you know. I don't feel strong. Well, something's wrong with how you feel. Yeah. You know what you ought to start doing? You ought to start quoting Joel 3.10. Joel chapter 3 verse 10 says, Let the weak now declare the strong. Yes. Yeah. If you'll start declaring it, you'll start believing it. That's right. Joel 3.10, Let the weak now say they're strong. You ought to quote Micah 3.8. Micah 3.8 says, Absolutely. Sure! I am full of God. I 
I'm full of your spirit. But truly, I'm full of power by the Spirit of the Lord Hallelujah. and of judgment and of might to declare unjudgment. Amen. 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 Get over them. Are you to God? Get rid of them. Amen. Well, anyway. Now we're coming back tomorrow at 10 30. And then at 7. Then we're going to uh, Beulah, North Dakota. Good Lord. Wow. You can't hardly get there from here. But it's, it's <laughs> you know, I, I, I like not to get here from where I was. But anyway, what a day to be alive. Good Amen. Lord. Yes. Then we go from there to Jim Baker's program there in uh, uh, Missouri. I tell you, what a day to be alive. How old are you? That's the same age Mary was when she gave birth to Jesus, 15. We go, well, I'm too young. Some go, well, I'm too old. No, you're just right. Yeah. That's right, just That's right. right. Not too young, not too old. What do you do? I'm retired. What did you used to do before you quit? I used to build fireplaces. Did you? God bless your heart. <coughs> That's kind of what I'm doing. I go around and try to put a fire in them. <laughs> got to got build, got build a fire. Hey, talking about fire, here's your verse. You ready for a verse about fire? Yes. Isaiah 64, 1. Oh, Lord! Oh, it's, it's a scream. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> bring the heavens and come down. Ooh. He said, I am, and I'm going to bring something with me, fire. Yes. He said, His fire yes. will burn up the mountain. Yes. Mountains there talk about obstacles in your way. Something keeping you from the promise. Oh, that you would rend the heavens. That you would come down. That the mountains might flow down at your presence. Yes. And look at that. The next verse says, yes. not only does it, will he bring the fire and burn that down the mountain, it will burn up the underbrush. Yes. And when the melting fire burns, the fire causes the water to boil. Yes. I like that. Water is the word. Yeah. Yes. Fire is the spirit. you believe that? Yeah. That's yeah. good. These guys are cute. <laughs> What's your name? God bless your heart. You're pretty smart. Do you know that? you got a good head. But, well, don't let that go to your head. But, uh, you're pretty smart. I, I should know. I took out her one, two times a day for four years. I was not very really smart. But I could play football. And you had to pass out and play football. Oh, what do you do? You're an intern in church? That's it. That means... You just do anything they say. <laughs> Quickest way to get promoted right now is servant. Quickest way up right now is servant. Honest to God. Man, a lot of verses we've talked about tonight. What's your name? God bless your heart. Do you believe he'll give you your heart's desire? Here it is. Everywhere I go, this verse gets quoted. Matthew 10, 41. If you receive a prophet, the name of a prophet, you'll get a prophet's reward. Amen. What the heck is it? <laughs> You're going to get it. I want to know what it is, don't you? <laughs> I'll tell you what it is. When I tell you, you'll have a hard time believing. I'll tell you what a prophet's reward is. It's the deepest desire of your heart granted by the power of God. That's what a prophet's reward is. Matthew 10, 41, Jesus said, if you receive a prophet, name a prophet, get a prophet's reward. Where, where is that at? 2 Kings 4. Remember the Shunammite woman? She perceived this as a mighty man of God that continued to pass by our house. Have you ever not met somebody and you know you don't like them? I don't like her husband. He's a, he's a rat. The Shunammite woman's husband, did you read about him? Most disassociated guy. See, it was the wife that perceived as a prophet. The wife perceived the mighty opportunity passing their way. Thank God for somebody with perception. Did you read that? What do you like to do, 15-year-old girl? <laughs> Music, that's good. You like the flute? I like the flute. I can't play nothing, but I like the flute. <laughs> I like the flute sound. And what's that big old fiddle? Oh, cello! Oh, I love cello. It stirs the spirit around. Cello does. I'm telling you, it does. It stirs the angel around. Hey, you're talking about angels? I've written a book about angels. Yes, I have. The Lord said, write a book about heaven's host, the faithful and the fallen. I was stunned how little there is out there about angels. 
They're mentioned 273 times in the Bible. Mm -hmm. New Testament and Old Testament. Every one of you that are believers have an angel that looks just like you. Yeah. Well, I don't know about Ada. I know this. We need them. <laughs> the ministering spirit sent down to Ada through the heirs of salvation. So I wrote this book. Uh, I, can I read the back of the book? Yeah. <clears throat> Let me use my Morgan. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Morgan Freeman boys. Here it is. <laughs> Who are heaven's hosts and just what are their assignments? They're angels, both faithful and fallen. The faithful ones are the good ones. The fallen ones are the ones that are on the bad side. But look, look what it says. In our modern society, many scoff at the reality of angels and demons or even the existence of the supernatural. However, to remain uninformed concerning such issues could prove to be extremely costly. The company of angels is as vast as the Word of God. If you believe the Bible, you will believe in their mission and their ministry. The forces of light and dark, good and evil, are on a collision course. And it is imperative that the saints of God prepare for this conflict. Amen. And so we need to know about angels. <coughs> Revelation 12, 12 says the devil's come down and he's fighting mad because he understands he's got a short time to work. So he's releasing evil forces like you and I have never seen in our day. But God is releasing war again. We need to know about it. I promise you, we need to know about it. So we started writing books. We got the book table somewhere. I know the pastor's got it set up back there. And I, the Lord came to me, Jesus did. He said, won't you sign books? I said, I don't sign books. He said, you do now. <laughs> Honest to God. So I said to my wife, we're going to have a book signed. She said, I didn't know we signed books. I said to her, we do now. <laughs> Honest to God. So I go, go back to the book table. First lady that bought a book, I said, I knew my name, so I signed it. <laughs> so I said, well, what's your name? She said to me, my name is Donna. And I said, D-O-N-N-A. -N -N and she said, that's right. So I was writing the word Donna. D-O-N-N-A. -N -N and when the pen made the last A, a Bible verse drifted across my spirit. Just drifted like that. So I thought, I'll write that verse. And she's watching me write the verse. And when I finished the verse, she fell over. Wham. She starts hyperventilating, gasping. That's it. That's it. That's the verse my mother used to train me. That has happened hundreds of times on the book table. God grew a guy a finger at the book table. Yeah, at least that, that's where it initiated that. Uh, I was signing books again. This guy comes with a big old bag around his hand. So I looked up and I said, I said to him, what happened to you? But I think he thought I said, what do you do? Because he said, well, I'm a carpenter, but apparently not a very good one. I cut my finger off. And I was joking. I said, you know, God's got original parts. That's what I said. And so here's what happened. Uh, we signed this book to him and his wife, and they left. Now, he, according to his testimony, he gets home, and he says, honey, something's wrong with my hand. And she's the one that bandaged his hand. And she thought, oh no, I bandaged it suit so tight it's lost circulation. Took it off and he had a finger. Oh. So they came back to what I was signing books and she said, now listen, she said, I'm not a wild-eyed charismatic. She said, I don't even believe in half that stuff. That's what she said. She said, I'm the nurse at the intensive care unit. I'm the one that bound his hand up. She said, he had his finger cut off here and rolled back and the skin tied it and God grew my finger. I took a picture of it with my phone. You can see a blue line, then you can see which finger grew out. Wow. See, Genesis 18, 14 says, is anything too hard for the Lord? No. Answer yeah. heck no. <laughs> well, it's actually Luke 1, 37. <laughs> with God, nothing is impossible. It says, with man, things are, but with God. There it is, Genesis 18, 14. Is anything too hard for the Lord? And then look, Luke 1, 37 says, with me and think you're possible with God. So, I hope you'll get the angel book. But I'll give you this one, since I picked on you all out, okay? Bring you back to the book table and I'll sign it for you, Carl. That'd be fun. Things happen at the book table. Look, we got it. an old guy who's off up somewhere up north. And this old farmer, uh, he had, uh, he's older than, well, he's real old. And he had cut off the combine. His daughter brought him to the service and I'm signing books and so I looked at him the daughters brought him up there and so uh, she's motioning to me so I get up from the book table and I walk over there too, and I said what is it and I'm asking him but the daughter answered no. well I'll tell you what it is 
We told Daddy to stay off the combine, but he got hard-headed, got out there on the combine, and fell off and messed his back up and got his leg crooked. That's what she said. The little guy standing there like this, like a thing. Yeah. Wife's and the daughter say, yeah, we told him to stay off. You can't tell an old farm to stay off the equipment. It's in him. You know what I mean? But he fell off the thing, and uh, so it hurt his back. And so I said, sir, can I pray for you? He said, yeah. Then he said, but I'm, I'm a Lutheran. <laughs> I said, that won't hurt. I fell up there, and he had two knots on the back of his back, right down there, about the size of golf balls. And I put my hand there, and I said, Lord Jesus, wham! Just like that, they went away. Old man starts shaking his leg and just had himself a little dance there. <laughs> Honest to God. And so I thought, boy, that was something. So the next night, he has a whole section full of his descendants. <laughs> so I'm back at the book table. And I look over there against one of the columns. And there's Mr. Hazelhorse again. There's his daughter. So I thought, maybe something's happened. You know what I mean? So I get up and go over there and I said, Sir, is everything all right? Daughter answers up again. <laughs> nope. He's stone deaf in one ear and the other ear is going out. <laughs> That's what she says. He, so I said to him, Sir, something wrong with your ears? He said, Yeah. I'm stone deaf and this one, and this one's going out. <laughs> so I said, Can I pray for you? He said, That's why I'm here. <laughs> That's what he said. So I stuck the fingers in his ears just like that. And I started praying, and so helped me God, it felt like all was pumping out of my fingers. I jerked him out, they was dry as a bone, but he was instantly healed. Yes. Forty years stone death in one ear. So his daughter stuck her finger in the ear that was supposed to be good, and she's back behind him, whispering, and he goes, Yeah, I can hear her back there. I hear everything she's saying. Isn't that something? Yeah. See? Here's something back the other day. See, if God did it somewhere else, he'll do it here. He's no respecter of persons. So here's what happened. I'm, I'm praying for people at the end of the service. And this old fellow comes, bless his heart. He's a little bit loud. And he's gnarled up. You've never, I, I've never seen anything like it. His fingers had turned all the way under here like with, with arthritis. And his back was twisted like this. And he, he's little. And here's what he does. He comes right up there to the prayer line. And he says, I ain't going to get healed. I got arthritis. I'll keep my arthritis. I don't believe in healing. So I said to him, what are you doing down here? And he wheeled around and said, Her! I don't want to go home with the mad woman, his wife. <laughs> so I said to him, Shh, you don't have any faith. I'll operate on your wife's faith. Remember Jesus when they let the guy down yeah. through the roof? Yeah. Yeah. Says when he saw their faith, yeah. he said to him, get up. Yeah. So I said, you don't have any faith, we'll operate on your wife's faith. Started praying and so helped me, it sounded like he was breaking moth panels. Ka-chow! God heals this old guy. He fell down and started giving me push-ups. Got behind me started doing deep knee bends. He started chasing me up and down in front of the church. <laughs> had no place at all to be here. He was walking to me. See, God can do anything. Nothing's too hard for the Lord. God raised my mother from the dead twice. That ain't bad for a southern bad. This is... <laughs> Lord told me, he said, it's my will to keep it a second time, but your prayers overrode my will. Look at God, huh? That's true. I need a line or God raised my mother from the dead. Can I tell you how it happened? Here's how it happened. I was preaching in Civic Center, me and a team, and I, my associate, a guy named Joe DeVilla, was over there in the, the, where you drive your cars through the thing, and I saw him doing like this. I thought, what is it? I'm with this the whole crowd of people. So I said, come here, Joe. What is it? Joe walked out there and handed me a note. He said, your mother's been carried to the hospital. Doctors say she's critically ill. If you don't come now, she'll be dead. So I said, Lord, what do you want me to do? He said, I want you to finish this meeting. So I finish the meeting. My wife and I get in the car, drive all the way to two or three other cities over to where the hospital was for my mother. And so I, I go in, just as I go into the uh, critical care place, I go in there, there's a door there with a little, one little pane of glass. The doctor steps out of the door with my sister. He's got my sister, in, and he, here's what he said. This is what the doctor said. First words out of his mouth is this, well, you're too late, your mother's dead. They didn't say I did all I could, I'm so sorry for your loss. Well, you're too late, your mother's dead. Now, I, I, I'm at the door now, it's closed. I see my mother over there, about where the flag is. She's on some kind of a gurney with machines hooked in. And so I take my sister to kind of console her. And so I'm stepping in there and the doctor kind of blocked her way. So I, I can't get to where my mother is. And here's what he said. He said... She's got a, a, 
a respiratory, but that's not her breathing. That's the machine because she's dead. I've been there less than two minutes, and he's already told me why she's dead. Then he says, she has a, a heartbeat, but that's not her heart beating. That's the machine because she's dead. Then here's what the doctor said. You'll leave her on the machine a couple of hours. That'll give you time to make plans with the mortuary to come get the body. Because she's dead. I said to him, that's what you say. Let's see what Jesus will say. So I said, I pray in the name of Jesus, the perfect will of God be done with my mother. She starts coughing and convulsing and bouncing all over the gurney. Scared the spit out of the doctor. <laughs> he put us out of the room. And he said, no, no. Put us out of the room. Me and my sister spent the night in the waiting room in the hospital. Next morning, we could go in at 8 a.m. or 10. Whenever we could, we did. Went in there. There's my mother sitting up on the side of the bed. All the machines unplugged. I said to the doctor, take off the machines. Guess what? My mother took herself off the machine. Honest to God. Pulled them out of her arm, unplugged the machine, and pulled the holes out of her throat. Yeah. Yeah. The doctor came in and said, go home. Go to her. My mother talk about that. Never read a book in her life about life after death. Uh, she got to go to heaven. Uh, isn't, isn't that something? She's there now. She died and stayed dead. <laughs> third time. Can I tell you how that happened? I'm in Austria, Vienna, Vienna, Austria, preaching. I get back to the flat. I'm staying 2 a.m. in the morning. I sit down on the bed to pull my boots off, and Jesus said, you can't go to sleep yet. I said, why, Lord? He said, I just want you to know I'm carrying your mother home to be with me now. So she died in Texas. I was in Vienna, Austria. So they called Germany, and Germany called Vienna. And the pastor I was with was a guy named Peter Lutz. Peter Lutz was a clinical psychologist before he was a minister. And so they called him, and now he's got to come the next morning to tell me my mother's dead. Can't you feel the weight of it? So anyway, I hear him park his car that morning. I hear him coming up the flight of stairs to the apartment I'm in. As I look to the little people, there he is. Oh, bless his heart. I can feel the weight of it on him. He's got to bring me this message about my mom dying. And so I opened the door and he took a breath to say, and I said, oh, Peter, don't worry. The Lord beat you here. My mother died last night. I thought he was going to shout. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Uh, have you figured this out? None of us get out of this alive. <laughs> Born it under wind, man wants to die. Then after this, that's true. But I tell you what, I want us to really see the kingdom of God come. I like when you sing that song about the band. We're a band. Yeah. yeah. We, I tell you what, we got to have. Here's what's coming to the church: a, ra a radical revolution that's going to redefine how we define Christianity. Yes. Yeah. A yes. radical revolution, but you can't have a, re a revolution with contented people. So yeah, for right. quite a while now, the Holy Spirit's been fanning the flame of discontent yes. within the hearts yes. of the saints. Yes. So they won't settle for less than what God wants to give us. Yes. So in, inside of you, you feel a divine disturbance. Yes. I'll tell you what's happening to you. The Holy Ghost is alluring you. It says, I will allure you out to the desert, and there I'll speak to you heart to heart. Yeah. So what you feel is a divine discontent. So you won't settle for less. Oh, listen. God is going to find him a people. Yes. That will really be bold and brave. Yeah. I'll tell you where we are prophetically. We're right smack dab in the book of Jude. Yeah. We've got to contend for the faith. Yeah. Put up a fight for what's ours. Yeah. I love the book of Jude. You ought to read it. It shouldn't take long. Just one page. <laughs> hey! <laughs> yeah, that's the book of Jude. I would never started the book of Jude like Jude started. I would have said something like this. Hey, I'm connected. How connected was Jude? Oh, he came out of the same womb as Jesus. He's a biological half-brother of Jesus Christ. They both had the same mama. I'd have pulled that card, wouldn't you? But that's not how Jude started his book. He said, I'm a common love slave of this man called Jesus. He said, I picked up my pen to write concerning the common salvation. Not common and cheap, but common in Hebrew 6.1. Elementary, rudimentary principles of Christianity. He said, I was, that's what I was going to do. The Greek says, but I got possessed. I was overcome. I was under compulsion yes. to write to you to earnestly contend for the faith. Yes. Why? Certain men have crept in under wares. 
teaching us. It doesn't matter how you live. They're here right now. They're in the body of Christ right now. Say, there's a crazy message out there about grace. Don't buy into that. Listen, the only grace you need to buy into is Titus 2.11. The grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world. Amen. Don't, don't you swallow a grace that gives you license to live loose. That's right. It's not the grace of God. Amen. The grace that produce holiness and sanctification is not the grace of God. You better read the book of Hebrews. It says they're doing despite to the spirit of grace. Man, we got to get out here, but I want to pray for you. Here, here's what God told me. You, you'll believe me. Here's what God said. He said, Bobby, that's me. Go where I tell you to go, West Columbia. Do what I tell you to do when you get there. I'll give the people whether they want it or not. An impartation from Hebrews 13, 20, and 21. Now, if you don't know what Hebrews 13, 20, and 21 says, it says, Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead the Lord Jesus Christ that great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the everlasting, never failing covenant, make you perfect. Yes. Give you everything you need to accomplish the task you're sent to do. Yes. That's what it is. Yes. Make you perfect. I looked it up. It means missing no component. Yes. Everything you need, you have. Yes. You believe in impartation, don't you? Yes. Here's your great verse about yes. impartation. Yes. Romans 1.11. Romans 1.11. It's a verse about impartation. Here's what it says. I yearn to be with you. <coughs> I yearn to be with you yes. that I might impart to you a spiritual enabling that will equip me for the task that is at hand. Romans 1 11. Romans 1 12 said it'll be good for both of us. Therefore, I long to see the word. That is, that I may be comforted together with you, the mutual faith, both of you and me. This will be good for both of us. You believe it? Yeah. 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 Yes, sir. Uh, Houston Astros. I was reading this shirt. Mm -hmm. Threw all my Dallas Cowboy ones away. I know I got them in the closet. I may get them out of here. Start playing again. I don't know. I like them when Tom Landers was there. You know, he used to come there at the end of it now. Y'all remember Tom Landers? See, he had Christian values. Well, anyway, we're here to talk about Jesus. Well, anyway. One time I took the platform, I can start to tell you a while ago. I took the platform in a great big old uh, Coliseum. I screamed, You know, there's no one like Jesus. And I meant it. The Holy Spirit said, Yes, and that's such a shame. <laughs> See, it's the will of God, the plan of God to make us everyone exactly like Jesus. Isn't that true? Yeah. Who's Jesus just like? <laughs> Colossians 1 15, he's the express image of the invisible God. Yeah. Well, I'm going to pray for you, okay? I'm going to pray that God will give us that impartation of being equipped with everything we need to accomplish the task we're to do. You and I need a bold anointing because of John 14, 12. These works that I do, greater works than these shall you do because I go to my Father. Amen. I very seldom take new conferences now every day, every day. So help me God, we get a stack of invitations from around the world. But a lot of I, I'm, I'm trying to go back to places we've been to build something, you know. So last year, a brother calls me and goes, Well, you're coming to the city. I said, no, no, I'm not coming. He said, yeah, the Lord told me you're coming. I said, no, sir, I'm not coming. He said, yeah, the Lord told me you're coming. I said, no, I'm not coming. Then he said, I said to him, okay, what's the name of your conference? Guess what he named his conference? you got to be kidding me. I said, I'm coming. <laughs> Any preacher that named his conference, you got to be kidding me. I'm in. <laughs> There's verses in the Bible. You read them, you go, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> yeah. Here's that, that one I just quoted you. you that's a you got to be kidding me. These works that I do, greater works than these. That's right. Isn't that something? Yes. Yeah. And he means it. Yes. Jesus told me, he said, tell my people I'm not a politician seeking to be elected. I say what I mean and mean what I say. Yes. See, he doesn't spew out rhetoric. He tells us truth, doesn't he? Yes. Say truth. truth. Truth is wonderful. It says buy it and sell it not. Well, you got to get out here, man. A lot of buttons up here. I have, I'm going to look at these buttons. <laughs> There's enough stuff up here, you could launch the shuttle. <laughs> Hey, I could crank this. Maybe I could sing. <laughs> Probably not. Yeah. Hey, guys, now, I like it when the sister jerked this thing up. I like him to... 
<laughs> see, I don't know about but see. <laughs> these things, you can make a lot of rackets, these. <laughs> don't give them to somebody who got time to do one of Stuff up here, man. I got That's good. I tell you guys, Ooh, glory to I like I loved hearing the Spanish, didn't you? Yeah. 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 I, I'm not, you know, I had to go, I went to London, England and had to have an interpreter. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm I went to London and had to have an interpreter. I'll tell you what, when you hear God speak, it's going to shock you. He speaks just like me. Yeah. Yes, he does. I'll tell you how God speaks, you don't know. He speaks exactly like you listen. John 10, 3, my sheep hear my... That's true. You go, well, I've never heard God's voice. You have if you're a Christian. That way the devil go, hey, you ought to get saved. <laughs> you, you understand that? Right, you gotta, you gotta. So I'm going to pray for you. Okay? Yeah, I read, I read those verses to you. Uh, Mary, I want to let you read that. You don't mind reading public, do you? A little bit? Come on, girl. I, I want you to read that verse in Job. Remember, I, I, I read it to them. They don't think it's really in there. That, that, yeah, Job 22, 28. You don't mind it, do you? Come on, God. I, I, I bring it over to you. Let me find Job. Let me find Psalms. This somewhere in here. I, I, I'm going to look at it. Here we go. Job 22, 28. This is it. I got it marked in yellow. Okay, just so, so they'll know it's actually in that one right there. Job 22, 28. You shall decide and decree a thing, and it shall be established for you, and a light of God's favor shall shine upon your ways. Hey! I, mean, I like that, don't you? Yeah. Let me tell you what happened. I'm in a big coliseum once, and I read that verse, and the people looked at me like, you know, and so I thought, they don't believe so watch this. So help me God. I walk out there in the Coliseum. There's two twin guys, two twin men. I think they're in their early 30s then. So I walked over there to this one sitting on the end. And I said, hey, I want you to read this. Job 22, 28. This one right here. The one marked in yellow. I gave him the Bible. I said, is this one right here? He got so nervous. I thought, good God, he's going to pass out. <laughs> and then I, I, I said to him, I, I, I thought, maybe he's just really afraid of people. And so I said to him, here, read this part. This part right here in, in the yellow. Then I said to him, you can read, can't you? 37-year-old guy and his twin brother sitting beside him. I said, you can read, can't you? Then I slapped him on the shoulder and said, all right, sure you can read. When I did that, he started reading, but he started reading for the first time in his history. Oh. He and his brother, brother both were born with this son. Did they see everything backwards? Oh. Hey! Yeah. And see, when I declared it, he started doing it. Oh. See? Now see, I wouldn't have walked out there and picked him. But God's ways are higher than our ways. You believe in the supernatural, don't you? The, all of these things can be proven. I'm in a meeting once up there, morning star, there's 2,000 people in the room, 2 o'clock service, I'm supposed to be preaching. And so the Lord said, get up and ask the people how they like the rain. I could see out the window, I said, God, we've got a problem, it ain't raining. He said, the problem is you had announced it. I get up there, Pastor, and so help me God, I said, and I screamed loud. Hey! How do you like this rain? When I screamed, hey, how do you like this rain? A clap of thunder came. It rained so hard, it rained through the roof. They had to set basket, uh, buckets out and catch the water. <laughs> yes. Amen. Yeah, well, you know, I don't believe in that kind of stuff. Well, in Oklahoma, I went to Oklahoma, you know. <laughs> and they, you know Patricia King, you ever heard of her? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. She's got it all chronicled. I go to Oklahoma. When they get off the plane, when the belt conveyor started, they started spinning. The Lord said, spinning winds! That means tornado. So I said to the preacher, uh, it'll be a miracle if we get out of here with a tornado, without a tornado. Many we would go to the church. Tornado's coming. At the church, a vineyard church in uh, Oklahoma City. And I'm over there in a little cubby hole getting ready to preach. Went straight from the airport, straight to church. And here comes this tornado. And the Lord said to me, if you don't get up and rebuke this tornado, I'm going to send it to this building, blow this building away, and hurt a lot of people, and hold you responsible. Now, I'll show you what I say. God, I'm going to need a verse for that. <laughs> I don't recommend this, but so help me, God, this is the absolute truth. I held my Bible, I stuck my finger like that, and saw me. 
It fell on Ezekiel 37 where it says, Son of man, get up and prophesy to the wind. Yes. So I get up. There's a doctor showing the tornado. I get up there. And this is what Patricia King has all the film of. I take authority over the winds. The weather channel has this all documented. The tornado is coming down like this. When the prayer goes up, the tornado stops dead still in the air, reverses its circulation, and goes back in there. It happened one other time in human history they have a record of. See? The power of what? Is in your mouth. That was true. This is either true or it's a big lie. And it's the absolute truth. It's the absolute truth. Well, anyway, in the morning. But I want to pray for you. I want to pray that God would equip you with everything you need to accomplish the task. I, I, I wrote down some things at the, how, at the house or the room I'm at that God's going to do tonight. Let's, I got it on a piece of paper here. <laughs> West Columbia, Monday, March the 3rd, 2014. God said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to heal hurting hearts. I'm going to restore hope. I'm going to give them Joel 2.25, Hebrews 10.35, and Lamentation 3, 20 and 21. He said, in the healing of the pains, uh, healing of the heart, I'll heal the pains of the past. And he said, I'm going to convince my people, Romans 8, 28, is genuinely for them. All things are working together for good to them that love God, who are called according to His purpose. So he's going to heal your heart, take away the pains of the past, Show you that anything and everything He does is for your goodness and for your behalf. Then He said, number two, He said, I'm going to give my people clear, precise guidance for the days they're facing. Yes. Yes. Psalms 119, verse 130, Nehemiah 9, 20, Ezekiel 36, 26, James 1, 5, and John 16, 13. Let me read John 16, 13. Can I? Then we'll quit. I like to know this read. Let me, let me find it. Who, 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 who will read this? Come on, somebody call it here. Here, here, here. Mary, you did so good with that. Where's that? Where's sister's microphone? Here we go. John 16, 13. This part right here in the game. Now, you're not getting part of the level. Huh. <laughs> here we go. No, you can have yeah, John, no, verse 13, start with verse 13. But when He, the Spirit of truth, the truth-giving Spirit comes, He will guide you into all truth, the whole full truth, for He will not speak of His own message on His own authority, but He will tell whatever He hears from the Father. He will give the message that has been given to Him, and He will announce and declare it to, the th to you the things that are to come that will happen in the future. Woo, I like that. When the Holy Ghost comes. He'll teach you and declare to you the things that are going to happen in the future. Amen. One of the number one businesses in America right now is the psychics. One nine hundred dollar psychic. Wow. You can't get help from a psychic. You can get a demon. They don't know what the future holds. This book says the Holy Ghost will tell you what the future holds. Did, it, did you hear it read it? John 16, 13. He will guide you. It's okay. So, I want us to know more about the Holy Ghost, don't you? Yeah. Holy Ghost, be our teacher. I know that you will anoint the people for miracles. You'll do the things that honors the Lamb of God. So, I pray for sick people in this room tonight. I pray this will be the night that they are responding to the wound of Christ. That healing takes place. I thank you you're going to heal hurting hearts. I thank you you're going to give people confidence and courage to believe you for what you have to say concerning them. You said... You've destined us to be successful. You want us to be the head, not the tail. So Lord, I want you to infuse that inner strength and confidence in your people. I pray for every person here. Lord, I pray if there's one here that has never given their heart to Jesus, this would be the time. They'd step out of misery and come to the Master. They'd come to Him and cry out to Him. I'm here to tell you guys, it doesn't matter how deep a pit you're in, He can pick you up. Psalms 40 says, I waited patiently upon the Lord. He inclined unto me. He heard my cry. He brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay. He set my feet upon a solid rock. The Bible said He'll make a change and a, a real difference in your life. So Holy Spirit, these are the people of God. Do anything that pleases you. Any way you want to do it, we say yes. Anybody here sick that wants to get well? 
Here's somebody standing if people. We'll pray for you. The Lord wants you to be well. Amen. We're supposed to be saying, on earth as in heaven. Amen. There's not one sick person in heaven. And it says when Israel came out of Egypt, there was not one sick or feeble among them. So there has to come a time when the church, no sick people. Yes. Paul said, what happened to Israel happened for us, for our learning, for our admonition, in whom the end of the world would come. Remember that? So if there was no sick or feeble when Israel came out of Egypt, there has to be a time in the church that's no sick or feeble. So all, each one of you that are standing, you're standing because there's something wrong with your physical body. Now, I'm not the healer. Benny Hinn's not a healer. Pastor's not a healer. Jesus is. 2,000 years ago, he did something. He stretched himself upon a cross. And he paid for our sins and our sicknesses. Psalms 103 verse 1 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, all that is within me. Bless His holy name. And don't forget all of His benefits. He forgives all of our iniquities. And He heals all of our diseases. Yes, Lord, You are the healer. It is by your stripes we're healed. Yes. And we're here in this room tonight to connect what you purchased with what we need. You said, I advise you to buy for me gold tried in the fire. So Lord, we're coming to become benefactors of what you purchased and produced for us. Say healing. healing. Lord, we're here to receive our healing. Yes. I thank you for every person that's standing. Thank you for the grace they, they, they exercise just to stand up saying, here I am. So, Lord, we release healing right now. Yes. I pray that the healing power and virtue of Jesus Christ would flood across this room, touch every man, woman that's standing, Lord Jesus, and touch their body. I take authority over sickness. I exercise my gift of Matthew 18, 18. Whatever I bind on earth will be bound for me in heaven. And whatever I loose on earth will be permitted in, in, on earth. So, Lord, I'm binding sickness now in the name of Jesus, and I'm releasing health and strength in the name of Jesus. Yes. We thank you for who you are, Master. Oh, yes. Now touch your people. We bow to give you the glory. I thank you hurt necks are healed. I thank you that rotary cups and, and shoulders that have been locked up are unlocked. I thank you that structure in the body is being lined out. Hips are rotating. Legs are growing out. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for all your healing power. Thank you, Lord, that you're healing somebody's rib cage, a fall, a, a strain when they landed. Lord, I thank you. And Lord, I, I speak to the heart, the physical heart. We command that heart to beat correctly. I thank you for proper blood pressure. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have authority over di sugar diabetes. Yes, yes. And all the yes. infirmities, every one of them is under your feet. Yes. Lord, we thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, I thank you you'll give your people sweet rest. Yes. So Holy Spirit of God, do anything you want to do in this room. Somebody had a stiff neck, you wiggle your neck, it's okay now. <coughs> Hips are rotated. You won't have the prolonged back pain any longer. Thank you, Jesus. I bind scoliosis in the name of Jesus. Crooked spine. I feel somebody's esophagus. Something has been wrong with the deep part of your throat, your esophagus. Lord, I thank you for healing. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you're healing their, their throat in Jesus' name. Yes. So I want you to say, I receive my healing. I receive my no matter what the doctors have said, God says I'm healed. That's what it says now. That's what it says. Remember? I love what the, the woman it says in Mark 4. She spent all of the doctors. Didn't get better, but got worse. But she said, if I can touch him, he'll touch me. Yes. She did, he did. Hallelujah. Remember Jesus stopped and said, who was that to touch him? The disciples go, what do you mean? Look at everybody bumping him. He said, no, somebody laid hold of me with faith. Yes. I felt healing. Mm. And it's the woman with it. Yes. So if he healed that woman, he'll heal you. Yes. You believe it? Yes. I do. Yes. You believe it? Yes. I do. Yes. Remember I, we said the heart's going to be correct, the lungs are going to... Yeah, you believe in uh, this irritated esophagus. I don't know what it is, but uh, it's been bugging me and God wants to heal it. Something's wrong with somebody's spine and God's rotating that thing, straightening out your back. Somebody's left kneecap has been messed up and God's fixing your knees. Lord, I thank you. It's better than titanium. <laughs> Where we've been in meetings where God takes that stuff out. Yeah. Wow. It's true. 
Yeah, bolts and screws. Yeah. So that's good. Put your hand on your body. Say, Jesus, Jesus. I receive my healing. Receive from, you, from you, right now. Right now. I, praise you for it. I praise you for it. In Jesus' name. Jesus. Now, I'll tell you about healing. When it happens to you, you can get it. Well, well, I, well, most of the time you can get it. I'm up here preaching while I'm up at a place preaching, and a professor, a professor comes, and she's precious. She's witty and smart as she can be. Talk psychology in a university. So she comes in and she says, I'm here because my shoulder is locked up. I said, yes, ma'am, but you're healed. And she looked at me and she said, no, I'm here because my shoulder is locked up. I said, yes, ma'am, but you're healed. She looked at me again like, you are thick. I'm here because my shoulder is locked up. I said, yes, ma'am, but you're healed. She said, no, you don't understand. I can't do it. You know, she, 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 she had herself a bit. She ran the floor and she did her a floor block. But since she didn't even know she was healed, you know, she threw her arm up. Isn't that something? See? Well, good. Let's get out of here. Y'all want to? Pastor, you, you've got a ministry team. Do whatever you want to do. I'll meet you guys at the book table. I'll have a book sign. I'll sign your book, okay? What's your name? Cindy? Cindy? Kinsey. Kinsey, okay. Well, I kind of write the tongue sometimes. So you don't speak. <laughs> glad you came. Are you glad you came? Yes, sir. I am. I'm glad you came. I don't even mean to. Glad this came. Amen. Well, that was awesome. Uh, we're going to receive an offering uh, for Brother Bobby and, and for his ministry. And, and so we do have offering envelopes uh, right there in the views. If you're making out the check, make it out to GCCC. And we'll give him one check when he leaves uh, tomorrow night. But we want to be a blessing to him. And, and so he ministers all over the world. has a tremendous impact. And so whenever we give it to his ministry, then we partner with him. And we have a share in his reward and, and what he does. And so you can't out give God. And I found that as you give, then God gives back to you. And He can do it in so many different ways, using individuals and in many different ways to get finances into your hands. And so the Bible says, give, and it shall be given unto you. So the first step is just giving. Sometimes it's difficult to let it get out of our hands. But when we do, the Bible says we're sowing seed. It brings a future harvest. Amen. So I challenge you to give. Sow a seed tonight. And whenever we receive spiritual ministry, then we support them. The Bible says give back of your material things whenever you receive ministry. And, and so we want to do that and bless uh, Brother Bobby and help him continue to, to minister to the body of Christ and, and uh, do what he does so well. Amen. So let's pray over the offering and then our ushers will serve us tonight. Father, we just thank you right now for Brother Bobby and his ministry tonight. and what he's doing here this week, Father. We pray that you supply his ever need. Father, bless those who give tonight and return it to them many times. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen. If our ushers would serve us, and then also I believe we have some announcements. And before they play the announcements, we do have CDs of the services available.